Hello, everybody, and welcome to Connecticut River Conservancy's live stream series. This is season two, episode four, Tales from the Trail, where we'll be exploring the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail, also known as the CRPT, which you'll hear said a lot today. My name is Stacy Leonard, and I'm the events coordinator here at CRC. We're thrilled to have this huge crowd joining us to hear some exciting stories from our source to sea paddlers, to learn a bit about the trail itself, and to unveil the new app that will help you navigate the river. As you may know, Livestream is our virtual venue for bringing our work and our rivers to you. And we have episodes planned through June. You can learn about the upcoming sessions and view recordings of past episodes on our website at ctriver.org slash livestream. And just a note, you do not need to write down any links today. We'll be sharing everything in, in our follow-up email this afternoon. A few quick details before we launch in. This is a very large crowd and we're in a meeting format. So we have muted everybody and I encourage you to stay muted uh, to discour dis discourage uh, background noises. Um, I also recommend that you set your view to speaker view, so you'll be able to see the speaker talking and not um, the hundreds of other people, unless you want to. Um, we really encourage your questions and we'll be answering them at the end of the program, and we ask that you type them into the chat box. We'll be monitor monitoring it through the hour, so if there are quick questions to answer, we'll address them as we can and do our best to answer as much as possible. We'll also be sharing the contacts of all the presenters later. So if you have follow up questions that you want to direct to a specific person, you're welcome to contact them. And finally, we are recording this presentation so you can see it later and others who aren't able to attend today. That will be posted on our live stream site and also on our YouTube channel. Okay, on to today's presentation. Um, the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail is a huge effort by a consortium of partners who seek to make this phenomenal 410 mile long river accessible for paddlers. We're thrilled to have several of the trail organizers with us today, in addition to our two sources sea paddlers who will be sharing their riveting river stories. I'm gonna introduce everyone up front so it'll be a little smoother transition between presenters later. We'll be starting our journey with Kristen Sykes, who will unpack the history and current state of the trail. Kristen is an executive committee member of the CRPT and is the Appalachian Mountain Club's director of Southern New England Conservation Projects and Partnerships. Then we'll begin our paddler's stories, hearing first from Kathy Brennan, who paddled the Connecticut in 2019 as a through paddler, which means she paddled all in one season. Kathy grew up on a rural lake in New Jersey and has been swimming, boating, and canoeing since before she could walk. Her first epic paddle was in 2009, the 740 mile Northern Forest Canoe Trail, where she later learned she was the first woman to paddle it solo. In addition to her source to sea journey on the Connecticut, the story she'll share with us today, she has completed the lengths of the Susquehanna the West Branch of the Susquehanna and the James Rivers. Tim Lewis will be up after Kathy, sharing vignettes from his journey completed in sections from 2017 to 2020. Tim lives in Rocky Hill, Connecticut, a mile from the Connecticut River. It's the first water he paddles in the spring and the last before winter arrives. He's a source to sea paddler and loves to paddle many of the rivers in the Northeast. He has also rode a raft down the Colorado River in the Grand Canyon three times and paddled his canoe on the Hudson River into New York City. He is currently president of Great Meadows Conservation Trust and a member of the executive committee of the CRPT. Finally, we'll hear from Gabrielle Chavalier, CRC's Paddler's Trail Coordinator and Lab Manager. She's going to show us what's in store with the new Paddler's Trail app and lead our question and answer period. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Kristen to start us on our journey. Thank you all for being here. Great, uh, thank you so much, uh, Stacy. My name is Kristen Sykes and I work for the Appalachian Mountain Club. And um, I'm also a big paddler myself, prefer to uh, canoe uh, 
and go on lakes and rivers. So it's really terrific to be with you all here today exploring the Connecticut River Paddler's Trail. Next slide. Terrific. Um, so many of you probably are already aware, but the Connecticut River watershed is really a tremendous resource in the Northeast and also in the country. Uh, it's 7.2 million acres uh, spanning Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. Fun fact, the river is technically owned by New Hampshire on that stretch. There's almost 400 communities representing um, 2.4 million people. Um, and it also shares the same boundary as the Silvio Conti U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge, which is a pretty unique refuge to share the same watershed boundary. Uh, in 2012, it was designated as the one and only National Blue Way, bringing great attention to this tremendous resource. Next slide. So with many of the efforts that uh, a lot of us are involved in, it is a tremendous amount of partnerships that uh, allow us to be able to do this work. Uh, the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail as an initiative uh, first got started in 2009 um, and they worked together in trail planning and development, building and maintaining campsites and improving access portage trails and disseminating information to visitors. Uh, so for over a decade, the Paddlers Trail was working on establishing these primitive campsites, uh, primarily in New Hampshire and Vermont, um, touched a little bit into Northern Massachusetts. And then prompted by the National Blue Way designation and um, then President Obama's America the Great Outdoors initiative, uh, in 2012, the AMC Trust for Public Land, Connecticut River Watershed Council then, NACRC, um, and the Vermont River Conservancy formed a Southern chapter uh, of the Paddler's Trail to be able to extend the trail into Massachusetts and, Massachusetts and Connecticut so it could reach uh, all the way into the Long Island Sound. And this is a coalition of over 20 groups in four states that are working to uh, advocate for the Paddler's Trail and to bring the source to sea paddle to reality. Next slide. So a little bit about the Connecticut River Paddler's Trail. It's a series of about 50 primitive uh, campsites, primarily for human powered recreation. There's over 150 access points along the whole 410 miles of the Connecticut River. Uh, it is envisioned to go from the headwaters um, in New Hampshire all the way to the Long Island Sound. And as I mentioned in the early 90s, uh, the Vermont Land Trust Coalition, or Vermont Land Trust established several campsites in Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, and we are working uh, every day really to expand on the trails that already exist, create new access points, and then to be able to bring the trail further into Massachusetts and Connecticut. Um, we do have an executive committee of the Paddler's Trail, uh, which works on a number of these efforts. And the trail really does benefit from generous contributions by paddlers like yourself, business contributions, and state and private grants. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit about the campsites. Uh, they're all different. As we know, the Connecticut River is a very unique environment. We have very rural, suburban, and urban communities. Um, so depends on the location of what all the uh, amenities are going to be at the campsite. Um, they are all first come, first serve. They're leave no trace. So um, prescribing to the leave no trace etiquette, pack in, pack out leave no fires, uh, in fact, leave the site better than you found it. Um, as I mentioned, they do vary from site to site. Um, some of them are on rivers and um, some of them are you know, in urban areas. So um, they do typically uh, contain two tent platforms for 10 to 12 people, an informational kiosk, a bear box, because we know even in the Connecticut River Valley in uh, urban areas, we'll see bears uh, walking along and moose. Um, and they also have a, typically a moldering privy, uh, which is a, um, a low maintenance composting, very efficient privy. Next slide. Uh, so how to plan your trip. And Gabriel's gonna talk a little bit more about some new resources we have on this. But if you go to the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail .org, uh, you'll find many different resources on how to find a campsite the description of the campsites, again, because they vary, um, and majority of them don't have potable water, but also some of them are uh, easily accessible to a road where you could walk to get ice cream or resupplies. Um, and then most importantly, there is a 
registration calendar where you can sign up for the campsite. Again, it's not a reservation, they're first come first serve, but this will help you determine where you might wanna stay. There are some campsites that are a lot higher use. So this might be a way to find a campsite that um, doesn't have as many folks if you were looking to have a um, experience with more solitude. Next slide. So what's next? Um, we do still have uh, a goal of being able to uh, close this 28 mile gap in Connecticut between Kings Island and River Highland State uh, campsites. So we do have a gap right there. Our goal is to have campsites every five miles. Uh, part of that is that if you got to a site and it wasn't to your liking or um, you, know, you felt uh, really vigorous that day and the wind was at your back, then uh, you might wanna go a little bit further um, so we do, we are uh, trying to create campsites every five miles. Um, so we do have this gap in Connecticut. Um, we're also working on ongoing stewardship projects and maintenance um, issues. One thing I'm really excited about is that uh, next week, actually the um, trail staff of the Appalachian Mountain Club are gonna be building a new moldering privy at our campsite in Montague, Massachusetts, the Hatchery Brook. So we'll have uh, that terrific amenity there. And then we are working, thanks to some grants from the um, Mass Trails uh, program and others, we're working to create a um, waterproof Connecticut and Massachusetts paddling map that will be an augmentation of the paddling map that we already have for Vermont and New Hampshire. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Kathy Brennan, who is going to take you for a trip on the river. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kristen. Hi, how's everybody? I wish I could see everybody, but nevertheless, I'm really glad to be here. So uh, through paddle, what's a through paddle? You know, when I started these adventures in 2009, uh, I have family and a group of close supportive friends. And this is some of what I heard. I heard that's dangerous. And I heard alone, why? And finally, you might get lost and you're crazy. Well, the fact of the matter is I was trying to be uncrazy because in 2009, I was about to turn 50. I was laid off from my job uh, during the uh, dot-com crisis and, uh, and I was going through a divorce and both of my children had left the nest and started careers and lives of their own. So, so I really felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me and I wanted to do something just to stay sane. Uh, water and nature had always been my... Uh, source, uh, how I uh, got peace. And so that's when I decided that's the, the genesis of these through paddles uh, adventures. So, uh, the, so, you know, I just needed time alone. So here's, I wanted to give you a little bit of background uh, because I would never suggest a solo through paddle for somebody unless you were extremely comfortable with the water. Uh, I grew up on a reservoir, one of five children. So we learned to swim as soon as we learned to walk just for my mother's peace of mind. Um, so, you know, again, always, always, mostly a canoeer, uh, but I've always been uh, on the water and in the water and uh, swimming has been a huge part of my life. Um, so in my 40s, you know, boating and swimming took a back job, you know, fell into the background once I was a uh, career and kids. But in my 40s, I was gifted a nine and a half foot plastic kayak. We lived in Tennessee at the time and I hooked up with the Tennessee Scenic Rivers Association and just did a lot of white water, probably eight to nine years. I was uh, spent weekends, a week at a time sometimes, just learning white water, paddling with guides and uh, getting a lot of instruction. So, so really I'm extremely comfortable in the water. And uh, it's, uh, so again, that's an important part of a, a through paddle. The other pictures I have here is, you know, I'm an artist, I'm a designer, I'm an illustrator, and I'm a teacher, uh, photography mostly, but uh, I have a picture of my kids, one of my classes. I really wanna inspire, parents and children to get out and to uh, experience nature and these trails uh, because the benefits are amazing. Then the final picture I have down there, that's my granddaughter because, you know, I'm a grandmother. My, uh, I have two granddaughters and I really would like to think that someday they will be able to do this kind of um, wonderful, beautiful adventures in uh, clean, pristine nature. Okay, we'll go to the next one. That's enough about me. Uh, and background. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is planning and gear for a through paddle. You know, you really have to have a good plan. Um, when I decide which trail to do, what I'm always looking for a blue trail. So the reason I do that is because 
I need a trail that's supported and the Connecticut Paddlers Trail is supported. That means that I have resources. I have a website. I have, I can look at some blogs, the maps, the maps are fantastic. So, so usually in about January, when all paddlers start to really long for the water, um, I lay those maps out and I look for dangers. I look for rapids. I look for dams. I look for portage uh, possibilities. Uh, so I, so I do that. That's the first part. And after that, then I look for, you know, campsites. Are there a lot of campsites? Are there uh, places and towns where I can resupply? So basically danger, comfort. Um, and like I said, the Connecticut Paddlers Trail really had everything I was looking for. So gear, I could talk a long time about gear, but I really have a limited time. So I'll, my boat, nine and a half foot plastic kayak, I can pick it up and put it on my shoulder. Uh, it's tough. She's tough. And, uh, and I love my boat. She's an open hull, so I can stuff her full of gear. They don't even make them anymore. But again, you know, I don't buy the most expensive gear all the time. The, my paddle that I had for eight years was the paddle that came with the boat. Um, my tent, you can see I've got a Coleman tent. I probably spent 60 bucks on that 10 years ago. It still works. Um, so the boat is important. It needs to be lightweight and tough. Uh, again, the rest of the gear, wheels. For a through paddler, wheels are extremely important because you have to portage. And I have found that just buy the best, toughest wheels you can because if your wheels break in the middle of a portage, it's, it's a drag. And I know that from experience. So, so really I, I use NRS wheels. I like them, they're great. They're lightweight, about eight pounds. Um, one of the other things that I really could not do without is my impression, uh, my event compression bags. Now you can see, I've got that slide on the bed, all those clothes are laid out. And then you see that little inset. So they're great, they're tough, they're waterproof, they float and they compress the heck out of my gear. So I really couldn't do without those. And one of the last things I would say for through paddlers is of course a, a water filter. I have a, an MRS water filter. I like it, it's about seven years old. There's all kinds of new technology. Uh, again, you just do need a really good uh, water filter. So again, I have a full gear list on my blog. So if you'd like to, uh, Oh, one more thing, clothing, you know, good clothing. I do spend on good clothing because I don't take much and they all need to really perform. And food, you know, people think food is a really important thing, but on this trail, really you have the opportunity to resupply every two to three days. Uh, you know, I have about three to five days worth of food in case anything should go wrong, just pouches of tuna, noodles, uh, anything you can use, make with boiling water. Uh, so, so food, really not big problem. All right, we can go on to that next one and talk about the source, the beginning of this trail. So I really wanted to do a source to sea paddle and that required about a mile hike up to the actual source of the Connecticut. And uh, it was pretty exciting. The weather was crummy that day. Uh, it was a kind of a slippery hike, but at one point I had one foot in Connecticut, Canada and one foot in uh, New Hampshire. So, so that was pretty exciting. You know, when we got close, you see that also the inset where there was about two, feet of snow on the trail. So really I got about 300 yards from the source, but uh, that day I was wearing wool socks and water sandals. So I hadn't planned on a snow, snow hike. Um, so the first part of the trail really is a bunch of, a series of small lakes, third lake, second lake, first lake. Uh, if you wanna do a true sol solo uh, through paddle, you really need a buddy for this. You need a buddy with a car because uh, you cannot navigate the water in between these lakes up at the top. It's, it's just too rough and it's dangerous. So, so the source was amazing. You're up in the northern, really right up in the northern forest and it's beautiful and it's pristine and it is uh, isolated and rural. So that was the source. It was a, a nice start. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Okay, the next thing we encountered, yes, that was the water in between the, uh, in between the lakes, not good for paddling. Uh, so the next part were lakes and reservoirs. So I, I just said the lakes were super easy and small and simple. Um, I did like the first one in an hour and a half, the second one in two hours. Uh, so really the lakes and reservoirs, are, the lakes were easy. Uh, Lake Francis was beautiful and there's a great campsite right there. I launched right into the river, um, but the reservoirs for me were hard. And that's just because I hit them on a day there was high wind, all day rain. Uh, so, so really the more and the calmer for the reservoirs for me, I could tell there were beautiful areas, but I just, uh, it was just the luck of the draw and that, that I had a tough time on those reservoirs for there. So, so that was that. And because reservoirs, you know, they're isolated, you have to portage. 
And these portages on the Connecticut Power Trail, they were not really difficult. Um, there were a few that were tougher than others, but really in the grand scheme of things, they weren't so bad. So one thing I will tell you about dams and portages, and I've done a lot of them now, is that they come in all shapes and sizes. You know, dams aren't a mystery. You can do the research. I have a list. I know where all the dams are before I go out on these adventures. And, um, you know, just be educated. You have to be educated and you have to be prepared. And then you have to be able to expect the unexpected. Because, you know, things change very rapidly on the river. And a portage trail that can be totally accessible and easy on one day, uh, the next day a storm can come through and it can be blocked or uh, you can have problems. So, so you know, portages are part of the adventure. You spend so much time paddling with your arms. It's great to get out there and, and give your legs a little bit of a workout. So, so I try to plan my portages for mornings so that I'm fresh. And if anything happens that I don't expect, uh, it's not a horrible, horrible thing. OK, so we can go on to the next one. All right, so this next section was just absolutely beautiful. Uh, my sister joined me for this, and she is a smart woman. She looked at the maps and she figured out the best section. And this was a, a probably eight to nine days of just beautiful, beautiful paddling. Uh, the water was moving, so paddling was almost effortless. There was beautiful scenery. I mean, you know, flowers and birds everywhere. Plenty of campsites. I mean, we had our choice of campsites. And there was a, a lot of little towns for resupply or delis or, or anything to get off, if you need to get off the water uh, for that. Now, one of the highlights on this was the uh, Path of Life Sculpture Trail. I saw it on the map and figured I was gonna stop and check it out. And so we stopped at also the uh, Great River Outfitters there and we needed a strap. So it was definitely a stop we were going to make. However, when we stopped, we walked up the path and we saw the sculptures in the distance and that was really cool, but we walked up and then we walked right into a little complex of buildings. There was a cheese shop. There was a restaurant. There was a brewery. I mean, it was awesome. It was amazing. It was like this little uh, knot of culture right out there in the middle of nowhere. So th that was really a highlight. Um, Munns Falls campsites were amazingly beautiful. River access only, my favorite type. Uh, Wharton State Park. Also, just a fantastic place. Uh, we, we pulled up, we had a, a lean-to right next to the canoe access and steps away from hot showers. So that was a beautiful place. And uh, yeah, so this was just, if I was going to plan a week, a day, or two weeks, or any kind of small or shorter trip, this is the sex. Somewhere along here, this is where I would totally recommend. So just an amazing, beautiful, beautiful spot. Okay. Now, towards the sea. So Beth leaves and off we go towards the sea. It gets deeper, it gets wider. Um, there are more people and there's more evidence of people, you know, cool bridges, um, more marinas, uh, more hotels, more restaurants, fewer campsites. So, you know, there are fewer campsites, but if you are doing it through paddle, really you have the opportunity to get to a hotel or someplace safe to stay. So. You know, and the Gillette Castle campground that's in that area that was a fantastic also small river access only campsite so. So as I got towards the sea, you know there are more boats uh, power boats and power boats they, they can be a little bit dangerous we're small they can't see us, I really try to avoid. Um, high congested areas, however, you know I hit this area during a beautiful Saturday and Sunday. My second granddaughter had just been born, so I was not going to wait around. She was two weeks early, by the way. I had planned to be there. And uh, so I, I wasn't going to wait around until Monday morning to start uh, to start paddling through. And um, so as long as you're just careful, you know, you have to get across the main channel. But because I had the maps, I could see there was a little side channel down uh, that would get me to the Long Island Sound as easily as the main channel. and. When I did that, when I turned into that little side channel, all of a sudden there was just high grasses on both sides. It became really quiet. You could just hear seagulls. And, and all of a sudden I got the faint smell of the ocean. And uh, that was a very, very powerful experience. To have come from the humble, humble, that lump of snow in the beginning and to paddle out and experience the, uh, see the ocean like that. That was an amazing feeling. And it was, that was my payoff because you know what? Things about a through paddle, you can't control everything. You have to go with the flow and the payoff in my mind is, is wonderful. And uh, so at any rate, 
that's what I have for you today. I've got uh, daily log entries on my blog if you guys are interested in the day by day trip. And uh, so thank you very much. Um, I'm going to leave this and give this over to Tim now. Tim. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Lewis. I am a source to see paddler with a very unusual story. But I'll let you read about that on the Connecticut River Conservancy's Paddler's Recognition page. Uh, this is a picture of me portaging through Bellows Falls. Not something you see every day. So you won't be surprised to hear that my friend Paul and I heard a lot of comments from people. One who turned his truck around and pulled up alongside to talk with us. And we were instant heroes at Miss Bellows Falls Diner when we stopped for breakfast. We parked our canoes out back, and when we walked in, everyone had questions. Going through town with a canoe gives you a lot of street cred. But portaging is not for everyone. And so what I would like to do today is suggest a few trips on the Connecticut River where you can have an extremely enjoyable voyage, a wonderful experience, without having to get out of your boat and carry your gear around a dam. So let's begin. If you would uh, want to learn about a river, go to its source, as Kathy said, and you really need to go to the source of the Connecticut River. It will give you a whole new perspective. This is Fourth Connecticut Lake, <clears throat> actually not a lake at all. It's a beaver pond. And to get here, you have to travel to the northern tip of New Hampshire, then travel up Route 3 till you reach the Canadian border. There you'll find a small parking area to the right for the trailhead marked 4th Connecticut Lake Trail. You don't need to notify the border agents. They know you're coming, although they may be lonely at the moment due to the Canadian border being closed to personal traffic. Just follow the trail, which meanders back and forth across the border for three quarters of a mile to the pond. This is where it begins its 410 mile journey to Long Island Sound and do take the loop trail around the pond before you return to your vehicle. I highly recommend that you camp at Deer Mountain Campground on Route 3 in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. This is campsite number 15, where as you can see, I have my tent pitched next to the Connecticut River where it is the size of a brook. I think this is one of the best sites at Deer Mountain. Use this campsite as your base. You can hike the neighboring woods in search of moose. You can explore the entire lake region and paddle all of the lakes, third, second, first, and Lake Francis, and if that's not enough, you can and you should paddle the East Inlet Pond. It's part of the East Inlet Wildlife Management Area and flows into Second Connecticut Lake. Also, if you have some extra time, follow the logging roads to Mount McGalloway Trailhead and hike to the fire tower for stunning views of most of the Connecticut lakes. When I began planning my Source to Sea trip in 2017, my friend Paul and I decided we would do the 385 navigable miles from Pittsburgh, New Hampshire to Old Saybrook in 13 days. We had only two weeks because our remaining vacation time was booked for other things. So dividing 385 by 13 gave us an average of 30 miles a day. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, that's like competing in the under round deck 90 miler at least four consecutive times without a day's rest. Yeah, that's um, exhausting, but challenging to keep on schedule. And that's the way a lot of my trips have been. So in 2019, when some of my other friends suggested we do a trip from Woodsville to Wilder Dam, a distance of 53 miles in five days, well, I wasn't sure I wanted to do that. Well, that's when Marge, who was planning the trip, said, you really need to slow down. And she was right. It was a lot of fun. And we put in on a Monday afternoon in Woodsville, just below the Narrows, and camped for four nights, taking out at Wilder Dam and driving home that Friday. Yeah, you can do this too. If you need some excitement, oh, sorry. Uh, it was August with uh, warm temperatures. Uh, we slept late. We swam every day. Uh, a lot of the campsites in this area are very popular, such as Harkdale Farm, Underhill, Roaring Brook, and the ever popular Gilman Island. At present, the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail has a calendar on our website where, as Kristen mentioned, you can put your name in for a campsite. But please understand that this is not a official reservation system. This does not prevent anyone else from camping there. As Kristen said, they are first come, first served campsites, 
but use this calendar to help find campsites that are not getting as much use and try them. We're still talking about ways to improve this. And by the way, Roaring Brook, uh, and the view from here is from Roaring Brook, is actually a small brook that passes through a small stone tunnel under a railroad track. Work worth pointing in with a headlamp to see the old construction, although you can't go far. If you need some excitement, this next trip is for you. It has a section of white water and starts at Wilder Dam, ending at Bellows Falls for 45 miles, again, four or five days. This is the Willard Bridge on the Ottaquichi River, about six miles south of White River. Incidentally, you can also launch on the White River to start and paddle down to the Connecticut and continue. Planning a trip with multiple rivers can make it a whole different journey, such as when I was paddling the Champlain Canal section of the Hudson River. As we passed the confluence with the Erie Canal, we realized we could just take a right turn and paddle all the way to Lake Erie. Another suggestion you may like is stopping for lunch at a place near or on the river instead of eating another camp meal. When Paul and I were passing White River Junction in 2017, I stayed with the boats while Paul walked to Big Fatties to bring back some really good barbecue. As you approach the midway point of the entire Connecticut River, you also approach Sumner Falls Rapid, and you'll hear it before you see it. A word of warning from the third edition of the Connecticut River Boating Guide. Do not run these falls unless you are an experienced whitewater paddler and have first scouted it. If you can handle whitewater, in other words, if you are confident you have the skills necessary and you have the experience, then start your run on river left. The pullout for scouting is 200 yards above Sumner at a well-marked trail, but understand you can only see the upper half. If you think this is beyond your skill, do not run it because the second half is more difficult. You can portage 210 yards to bypass the rapid on a well-used path on river right. If you can run it, stop halfway to scout the second half and run this only at low water levels. Further south in Massachusetts, a wonderful place to launch is in Barton Cove above Turner's Falls Dam and paddle up river when conditions are right into French King Gorge. Farther down river, you can launch at the Sunderland Bridge and paddle either up or down river because the current here is slow in the summer. You can also launch at the Oxbow State Ramp in Holyoke and paddle north from here or south to Holyoke Dam and back. Last year, I met a woman who launched her kayak every weekday morning from the Oxbow Ramp for a paddle before going to work. Moving down to Connecticut, my home state, there are some good weekend campsites, including Selden Island pictured here. It's very popular and requires a paid reservation since it is a state park. And I think it's only about $10 a night, so, so plan well ahead. From here, you can explore Deep River, Essex, Chapman Pond, which also has its own Paddler's Trail campsite, and Hamburg Cove, giving you a lot of paddling opportunities. There are some excellent day paddles in this area. This is the city of Middletown and is known by some paddlers as the Three Rivers area. You can paddle the Connecticut River, the Matabasset, and the Coggenchog, and have your choice of launching from either one. It's important to note that the Connecticut River is tidal from Hartford on down. So knowing the tide in the area you are paddling is a really big help. A reference that I find useful for tides is saltwatertides.com. Just choose Connecticut, the Connecticut River, and choose the town nearest your location and the date you wish to paddle. The Salmon River is another popular paddle location. You can launch midpoint at Sunrise State Park or at the confluence of the Connecticut at the Salmon River State Boat Ramp and paddle up to Leesville Dam. At the very lower section of the Connecticut River, you will find some absolutely wonderful places to explore. There are many fresh and brackish water tidal marshes teeming with life. Lord Cove is one of my favorites. You can also explore the Lieutenant River, Black Hall River, or you can paddle around Great Island, which is what you see here. And again, remember, the Connecticut River is tidal here. Use the tide to assist you and understand that when the tide is coming in, the Connecticut River actually flows north, flows inland. So you can plan a day where you can paddle north with the tide and then after you've had lunch and some time to relax, turn around and paddle south with the tide or vice versa. So paddle smart, not hard and enjoy the Connecticut River and all it has to offer. 
Now I'd like to turn it over to Gabrielle, who will introduce an exciting new way to navigate the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail. Gabrielle. Hello, everybody. Uh, before I jump into talking about the app, I just want to take a second to say that both Kathy and Tim, uh, we call them source to sea paddlers because they've, you know, done the whole 410 or so miles. And so I just wanted to put a plug in if there are folks on this call who are also source to sea paddlers. Um, if you want to visit ctriver.org slash paddlers recognition, it's a great space for you to register your own journey. Um, tell us about, you know, tell us stories from your trail, get a boat sticker um, that says, I love my Connecticut River, and be able to share your story. And um, if you're interested, you know, do events like this and continue to talk to people about your journey. All right, next slide, please. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about a new app and smartphone guide that was launched on World Water Day. So March 22nd, just last week, we figured um, as people are thinking about how water is important to them, um, I know a lot of paddlers, myself included, are you know, looking out their windows and hoping to get on the river soon. So we thought, what better time to launch the smartphone app? Next slide, please. So the project came about as a drive from the executive committee and other folks using the trail to think about ways to enhance the um, tools and resources that are available to paddlers. So we have um, the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail.org, which is a, a huge resource for folks planning their trips. There are paper maps, there are guidebooks, and we're thinking about what's a way to kind of consolidate a lot of that information into a format that's easy for a lot of folks to take out on the river. Um, and yes, you know, always good to have a companion map or a companion guidebook when you're using a smartphone, uh, just in case, but another way to kind of get real time information, because as we know, some of the maps you can't, you have to rerun a printing, so you can't have that updated information. But if someone says, you know what, we have a new campsite at this site, tomorrow that would be on the app. So thinking about a way that's real time to get updates to folks who are paddling the river. We partnered with Atlas Guides and they're the creators of many long distance trail guides. So they do guides all over the world, but they have some for the New England National Scenic Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, a lot of these National Scenic Trails and other kind of bundles. So there's a White Mountain bundle. And so we are nestled within a lot of other great trails titled East Coast Long Trails. So amongst um, Monadnock State Park, Stratton Mountain, other popular, popular tra trails in the area. And the exciting bit is that the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail is their first ever river trail, their first blue way. So they're really excited about it, as excited as we are, I hope, <laughs> um, about this new opportunity. The next slide, please. So a few of the key app features, I won't be able to get into all of them, but one of the best parts about this app is that it's GPS enabled. So that allows folks, if you purchase the app, you download it onto your smartphone, you're able to track yourself in real time anywhere on the map. And what's exciting about it being GPS enabled is that in places where there might not be service, maybe up in the North Country, up in those regions of Vermont, New Hampshire, or those one-off spots in Massachusetts where you don't have service, you're still able to locate yourself geolocate yourself on the trail. So if I pulled it up right now, it would tell me that I'm at CRC headquarters in Greenfield and that I'm not on the river, but I would be able to say, I'd be able to pick a campsite, maybe the Waitley campsite or campsite in Sunderland, Massachusetts, and it would tell me exactly how many miles away I am from that campsite or from the nearest access point, and then I can get directions to it via Google Maps as well. So thinking about the ways that this app can help paddlers figure out where they are in relation to the things they care about. And you're able to find those things um, using the specific icons that are on there for rapids and boat launches, portage trails. You can see on the right here the image of what the app might look like on a smartphone. And you can see all those little circular dots or different waypoints or points of interest that paddlers could find on the trail. Exciting bit is that um, this is constantly evolving. Like I said, if someone has a new campsite, we could get that on the app today or tomorrow, but it also allows users to provide feedback that goes directly to the Connecticut or to the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail Executive Committee to help drive maintenance projects, help drive improvements. You know, you get to a campsite and you say the privy is missing. You know, that's information that is helpful for us to know and can, can lead those changes. 
Um, the last bit is just that proceeds from the sale of the app uh, go towards funding these trail projects. So they go straight back into the fund that helps with these, these maintenance projects. So it's kind of comes full circle. Next slide, please. I just wanted to give you a quick uh, image of what it might look like on a smartphone. So luckily, these are some sites that I think Tim talked about. Sumner's Falls, the Rapids, and then Roaring Brook Campsite, a popular campsite. And so if you look at these different icons on the far left on the Sumner Falls image, this is what it might look like when you click on that icon. And you can see that the primary icons here are the um, triangle uh, warning symbol and then it has the rapid symbol it has a simple a symbol for portage and it also tells you that it's class three rapids and then there's a little description underneath it a photo so you know what you're looking at and then you can also click the show on the map to show to pull that back on the map and see where you are in relation to them because you might want to know oh i'm half a mile out from these now's the time to start paying attention in the middle again just what it might look like on a zoomed out function and you can see that you could click on the parking near White River Junction and figure out uh, where you should park. Have the lat long there and easy to find. And then the last one on the right, just wanted to show you some more icons of maybe what it would look like for a campsite. And so the icons here are camping. You can see the little privy sign and then that there's no potable water so that you'd have to, you'd know that you'd have to boil or treat your water at this campsite. And it has a little bit of information in that description no fees, maximum group size is $10 or is 10, 10 people. And then it has a little bit of information about who stewards it and what it looks like at the campsite. Next slide, please. So the question of the hour is if you're interested, how do you get the guide? And so the important part here is that you would look for gut hook guides in the app store. And so gut hook guides is a free download. And then within gut hook guides in the app, you can see on the left here in this photo, that's what it will look like. It's kind of that north arrow on a bluish green background. So you'd search and download gut hook guides. And then within gut hook guides, you could search for the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail. And that's when you have to make the purchase of $9.99 for the guide itself. But good to know that once you do that free download, there are also some free trails around in the area as well. So you can look through, there are some, you know, some sets cost $35, some will cost $10, some will cost um, $0. And so this one is set at $9.99 just so the trail can kind of continue um, pushing through some of that funding to help with those projects. So again, free download, then search for Connecticut River Paddlers Trail within the app. And then from there, you're good to go. Um, and so from there, head to the river and enjoy. And if you have any questions, um, you'll all be getting my emails. So I'm more than happy to answer questions about this. Next slide. All right, so that brings us to the end. Perfect, we're right on time, it's 1245. And so folks have been entering questions into the chat and we've been collecting them as we go. So if you can enter your questions there, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, just one more time, thank you for joining us today. And if you missed any of the links um, and you, if you wanted to save our contact information, a thank you email will be sent out after this automatically to everyone who registered. So don't worry if you missed anything, um, you'll be able to have our contact information from there. All right, thank you. All right, and so without further ado, I think we're going to take it straight to question and answer sections. And I guess I'll take the first one away and then Stacy Leonard and I are going to be alternating back and forth who is asking the questions to our panel of speakers. So I think the first question, um, maybe we can start, it looks like a question for Kathy and Tim. And it's a question about how long it takes to do the entire source to see journey. And I think the answer is that it varies. So maybe if Kathy, you want to speak to yours and then Tim, if you want to speak to yours. Sure. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm a slow paddler. I go about three miles an hour average. And so it took me, it took me just under a month and um, yeah, which is great. I love about a month because it takes me a little while to get into the trail. And then once I'm into it, it takes me a little while to think about going back into the real world. So a month long, that's what it took me. Tim? Well, uh, like I said, as I had originally planned, it would have been two weeks. And, and a lot of my friends also have done it in two weeks, but it, it can be a little grueling. So if you have a little extra time, 
um, spread it out a little bit. If you know what your distance is that you can paddle in a day, you can kind of figure out, you know, what works for you. But uh, I would say if you're a slower paddler, then yeah, probably maybe a, a three week trip would be ideal. You can even take a rest day. I'm still waiting for CRC to give me a month off of time. Yeah. To go to the if you talk to Andy Fisk, let him know. That okay, I I'll him put in a good word for you, Gabrielle. A month to do the whole thing. Uh, Stacy, did you want to take the next question? Sure. I see that um, a lot of the questions are being answered as we go. So I'm just trying to find the next, um, the next uh, open question. Um, I did see one about navigation. Somebody was wanting to know uh, something. I'm trying to find it, but somebody was wanting to know how you know where you are um, and can you use a GPS and so on. Okay, go, go for that and we'll come back. <laughs> yeah, the new Paddlers uh, River app, the, the Paddlers Trail app is, is excellent in pinpointing your location, showing where you are, showing how far you are from a campsite, from a put-in point. It gives you a lot of good information. Um, uh, it, it, barring that, and you should have more than one uh, means of navigation. I'm a map reader, so I love having, you know, I use that app, but I also love having a map as a backup. And so when I'm in places like, uh, I, I did a nice uh, five day trip on um, Flagstaff Lake up in Maine. I got a good map and with that map, I knew where I was at, at all times, but I could also use GPS in case I, you know, I had any questions. So. Um, any of those two sources uh, to combined will uh, let you know exactly where you are. Great. There's uh, several questions where people are asking about the registration system and the calendar and what, to, what do you do if, if um, the, a campsite is full when you arrive. So I wonder if you, either of you could speak to that. I saw somebody ask about the platforms. If the platforms were full, would they be able to uh, camp on the ground? And I think the answer to that is yes. Um, and uh, I'm not sure. Um, sometimes actually, uh, you know, like I've gone to a site, like for example, the main uh, trestle campsite. You know, I've been there a couple of times when it can get very buggy. And so rather than camp in with the mosquitoes, we decided uh, to just go out and, and camp on the gravel bar. Um, you know, we still used the privy that was there. We didn't, you know, we left no trace and uh, it was actually a quite, quite a nice spot to, to pitch the tent for the night. I think the important thing to remember is that a lot of these campsites are um, stewarded by different organizations. So there's no trail wide system that says every campsite is the same or every campsite has the same like some it's a fee based reservations like the ones some of the state ones down in Connecticut in for the upper valley land trust campsites in the north country those are a donation based and you can find information like uh, I think Kristen had a slide about this that says here are the descriptions of all the campsites and then here's where you can do that calendar and you can post your intent to stay. And that way you can find, if you say, I don't wanna be at a busy campsite this weekend, you could look in that calendar and you can say, oh, I see that a bunch of people are at the Roaring Brook campsite. Maybe this is my time to explore a campsite that's 15 miles north for a different, a different area. So it's just, it's hard to say, it's not a reservation because it's, it's managed by so many different partners and that kind of gets a little bit trickier. Just to say that registration system helps you figure out where people are spending their time and allows you to plan around that. Um, can I, if, unless Kathy, you had anything to say about campsite registrations or Kristen, I was gonna move to the next question. Is that all right? Uh, no, um, I just, if I, I hope that campsites are available and I really have never came upon any campsite that was uh, taken when I was on the trail. All right. Um, so the question is, is it possible to portage around all rapids? Um, I will start by saying that again, in the app and on the website, all information about portages are listed. So if you're looking for detailed, this is exactly how many steps you have to take. This is where the exit is then that's a good place to start. But I'll, I'll leave it to Tim and Kathy to kind of talk about their experiences with the portages. Um, I did portage around the Sumner. You know, I portage around anything that's a class three or above because, you know, I'm alone and it's just dangerous. So uh, I really had no problems. There were not very many rapids along this paddleless trail. 
And so it, it really wasn't an issue for me at all. The one portage was fairly easy and uh, yeah, just, I didn't really encounter any really dangerous rapids. And if I did, I was able to portage around. Um, there was uh, an incident I remember, I think it was it's Beecher Falls uh, Rapid. Uh, and um, we had asked, stopped and asked a fisherman where it was. And he told us it was about another mile downstream, but we realized when we got a mile downstream that we had actually gone through the rapid. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, we're whitewater paddlers. And so, you know, it didn't, we're not, you know, we were, we were fine. Uh, if you are concerned about it though, I know there's a trail around it that you can use. There's a trail uh, for most of them. And the biggest rapid on the river is the Sumner Falls Rapid. So there is a path there on river right. And if you are unsure in any way, I encourage you to use it. It's an easy carry, 210 yards. Um, and so you can be back in the water and, and feel safe. Um, I was just gonna say on portages, um, I've paddled the Massachusetts and Connecticut stretches so far. I haven't made it up north yet, but um, in Massachusetts, uh, as part of the FERC relicensing or the licenses for some of the power companies there, um, First Light does provide a shuttle from the Barton Cove campsite on Route 2 around, and I have successfully used it. Um, you know, it's good to check ahead of time. Someone asked if they were operating this year. Um, they are required to operate them as part of their uh, license for their uh, energy generation from the Connecticut River. Um, but I called, you know, ahead of time to say we're going to be using it on the state, and then they said just, you know, let us know a half hour ahead of time when you want to be picked up. They up there were about a half a dozen of us threw our boats in the back and um, gave us a ride. Um, you know, I guess I would say maybe think about COVID restrictions and what may still exist because we did actually all pile into the truck. Um, so <laughs> that may be an issue right now unless you wore a mask um, and you should wear one anyway. Um, but there, and also I believe that Holyoke Gas and Electric also is required to provide a portage around the Holyoke Dam. I will say um, some may know that AMC and CRC and others are currently working on the relicensing of the Turner's Falls Dam, the Northfield Pump Storage Station. And one of the things that we're advocating for from First Light is to be able to have um, an easier way to get around the river there so that you can actually get around and also potentially have some whitewater uh, paddling opportunities there too at Turner's Falls Dam. So, and we're also working on improving the put-in at Poplar Street, which um, is not terrific right now, as many of you who have tried to uh, get your boat down there um, if you're not doing a through paddle. So um, stay tuned. We are trying to get some improvements. Um, and I know that Kathy Urfer from CRC just commented as well about some um, things we're trying to improve in um, Vermont and New Hampshire too. Yeah, I should I'm also add uh, just a, a word of caution to everybody. You know, a lot of people are anxious to get out and to get on the water and to paddle. Just be aware that right now the Connecticut River is swollen. It's uh, uh, high in many places because of snow melt and rain that we've had, plus rain that is predicted. So uh, just wait a little while, let the river settle down and have a, a nice safe experience. I believe that there are about eight USGS stream gauges along the um, Connecticut River, and those are all linked on the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail website. So if you're curious about flow gauges and kind of where the river is this time of the year, that would be a great place to a great place to start. Because yeah, like Tim said, cold water paddling is is dangerous in the best of times. So make sure that you're prepared before. Um, that actually leads us into a question I saw, Stacy, um, that said, "Warm weather uh, did a storm change your daily plan?" So I was wondering if you folks could talk about how if you're through paddling, you said, you know, sh your sister brought the good weather. So what happens if you don't have good weather? What does it look like when you're on a through paddle for a month and you can't plan exactly what the, those weeks are gonna look like? Well, I'll take that. You know, talk about go with the flow. I mean, that's the thing about a through paddle. You, you're, you're, you have to go and uh, bad weather happens. You know, I have my smartphone and I can see what the weather is, what they're predicting. and. Very often, you know, it doesn't come to pass. So, you know, it's just kind of common sense. Really, I find like literally watching the weather and uh, paying attention and also looking at the weather forecast. But, you know, sometimes you have to paddle in rain and uh, that's where good clothing and good equipment come in handy. So that's that. Yeah, and I'd like to add the day that I took that picture that I showed of Sumner Falls, um, it 
poured that day. It poured all day. The black and white picture that uh, that showed me in my canoe, if you notice, there are a lot of raindrops there. And later on, after we got past Sumner Falls, before we got to Bellows Falls, it rained so hard. We were in the middle of the river, could hardly see the riverbank, and we were bailing our boats every 45 minutes. <laughs> so, you know, if I recommend that everybody get good rain gear because mm -hmm. it's going to rain and <laughs> rain is part of the journey. And so as long as you have the right equipment to uh, keep you warm and uh, keep you as dry as you can, you'll be fine. Great. I just want to take a, an interlude here to say, no, we're, we're coming towards one o'clock and people are going to have to go. Uh, someone asked if we could put all the answers to the questions in the email that we send later, and we'll make sure to do that. So if you need to go, uh, we're happy to continue answering the questions and sharing that with you later. And maybe we could, if folks are okay, we could take an extra five or so minutes after one o'clock if people want to hang out and, and talk some more. So there's a, a, a great question here that, that I hadn't thought of. And, and someone is asking, if, is there a way to find a paddling buddy, buddy to do a source to sea journey if you have no friends or family to go with you? How do you do that? Uh, Kristen, I think had uh, posted uh, uh, a link um, which showed there is a message board um, on the CRPT website and it might be possible to uh, find uh, somebody who is in the same situation. Um, also, uh, my friend Marge Nichols, who's here today, posted uh, a message uh, that, uh, you know, sometimes it's a good idea to, to look for local paddling clubs in your area. In our particular area down here in Connecticut, we've got the New Haven Hiking Club, we have the Mishamasic Hiking Club, but they don't do just hikes. They also do a lot of paddles. And so you can then a uh, group with a lot of people who have uh, common interests and a lot of paddlers and coordinate trips. And, you know, and I, I'll say one more time if I have a little bit. Um, my trip on the Connecticut River, I ended up meeting two wonderful friends, um, Peggy and Don, and uh, we instantly connected. And uh, now, you know, we, we, we were always in contact with each other and we did the Flagstaff Lake trip together. So, um, being on the water gives you an opportunity to meet other people who have the same interests as you. And so, you know, uh, just ask around and, uh, and join clubs if you can. That, that is a big help. And um, I'll just give a promo for a club, which I'm a part of. <laughs> Sorry. Club, um, that, you know, we, we do have um, paddling committees for our Connecticut chapter and also our Western Mass chapter. Um, Barry Gorfain, who's the flat water paddling chair for the Connecticut chapter, actually led a whole paddle on the Connecticut stretch of the Connecticut. Um, it was done as day trips. Um, and there's a pretty active paddling group with the Western Mass um, paddling committee. And um, they also go up into New Hampshire and Vermont. I put the Western Mass paddling committee um, link in the chat and I'll find the Connecticut one as well. So, um, and they also do, you know, white water and lots of other stuff. And you don't have to be an AMC member to go on the AMC trips. I would also say, I was gonna plug AMC paddling chapters as well, but I'd say that there's a lot of, if you're a Facebook user or a social media user, there's a lot of groups, um, you know, I know there's like a, there's New England hikers, New England paddlers, Western Mass women's paddling. There's all of these different organizations. So I think, that if you're looking, you just have to be looking in the right places. But I think, like Tim said, that there are great organizations to partner up with. Um, and also, I think if that's an interest, maybe something that the executive committee can think about for the um, the website, the Connecticut River Paddlers Trail website is kind of beefing up a section where, where paddlers are able to talk to each other because it exists. And if it's not being used, maybe we could change it so that folks are using it more. So. You're giving us good good things to think about. Stacy, do you think Great. we have time for one more question? Uh, sure, let's do one more. But before that, just in case people have to have to hop off, I just want to thank our presenters enormously for sharing all their tidbits of stories and great wisdom about the trail and all the work that the committee and all the partners are doing to make this trail possible and keep it growing and adding all these campsites. It's really a phenomenal project. So thanks to all of you and thanks to everybody who joined us today. It's, it's really exciting for us to get such a large crowd. And uh, 
this is recorded so you can watch it again or share it with other people and we'll be sharing all that stuff later so yeah let's take one or two questions oh, can for... i just add one more thing stacy before Please. that last question um you know we are still trying to close this gap in connecticut um and then also always looking for new opportunities for campsites and access points so if anybody has uh, tips or thoughts of you know where we can put those or we you all, all are our eyes and ears on the river so we are trying to complete this whole source to sea paddle and um, we are happy to take a day out of our busy work day in front of the computer on zoom to go scope out a new potential campsite or access point so uh, let us know please <laughs> great um, I don't know if you had a special favorite question uh, Gabriel but um, I see one that might be helpful. No, I invite you. You might appreciate this one as someone who plans a lot of events for CRC, but I saw a question that says, if you see a lot of trash, uh, is that uh, something you can pinpoint or something that you can, uh, I don't know what to do about that. And I think part of that is just saying thank you to folks who are out there and are, you know, participating in leave no trace for their own garbage, but also saying that as you see stuff throughout the river, maybe you take some of it with you and, um, and take it take it to a dumpster so it's not in the river anymore but thinking about if you see a lot of trash or something you can't move yourself that is something that um, through different cleanup events I know CRC does a source to see cleanup event I think within the app you are able to create a waypoint but that's another thing where you can report it on the website or reach out to folks at CRC or AMC if there's issues with the campsites or if you see large large pieces of trash so that's my one plug and Stacy why don't you why don't you take the final question awesome um, just there's one about talking about the pros and cons between going by canoe or kayak. And I thought that would, would be interesting to tease out a little bit. I think that's a great one to end on. Well, I, I, can, I can speak to that a little bit because, uh, you know, I, have, I was a canoeer all my life and, that, and now I'm using a uh, kayak. The reason I'm using the kayak is just because it, it's, it's tough and it's really lightweight. Um, and it was a little bit of a learning curve. The other, what people said, my, my boat's an open hull, but you know, I wear a skirt in bad weather or in any kind of rapid. So, so really, you know, a lot of, I've been told you can't do this in a recreational kayak. Well, you know, I, I did and I do all the time. So, you know, that's, that's, the kayak is just good for me because it's small and it's lightweight. But again, I love canoes and you, you can certainly fit lots of gear in the canoe. So Tim, you might want to talk to canoes. Yeah, um, actually, I don't think it really matters what boat you use. I was born in a canoe and I have canoed all my life and I, I, you know, I love a canoe, but there's really nothing wrong with a, with a kayak either. I took uh, the, uh, a, a touring kayak on the um, Woodsville to Wilder trip and the only thing was, is I just had to figure out how to pack differently. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a canoe, I could just put myself in a couple of bags, toss it in, and I was all set. With a kayak, well, now you're limited in terms of where you can put your gear. So mm -hmm. that's the real, really the only difference. And may I also say that a friend of mine, uh, Alyssa, uh, Alicia, uh, did a uh, trip down the San Juan River on a stand-up paddleboard. <laughs> uh, you know, you just uh, basically strap your gear on the deck and, and, the Peggy and Don that I mentioned, Don was rowing a boat uh, and his boat actually looked like a stand-up paddleboard, but it's a very, you know, flat top boat. And same thing, he strapped his gear uh, to the deck. So any boat that you have, as long as it doesn't leak, will work. <laughs> great. Thank you all so much for joining us today and sharing all this great information. Um, we will follow up with you by email We'll try to answer all the questions that got left unanswered and you'll get the contacts for our presenters so you can follow up with anyone specifically. So thanks again. We hope to see you at future live streams. They're on various Wednesdays from now through June and uh, we'll, be sh we'll be posting two new ones that aren't up there yet for May and June. But our next one is River Connections. It's uh, gonna be with some guest presenters uh, Christine Hatch and Brian Yellen from UMass. It should be a really wonderful episode. So join us and have yourselves a great day. And we hope to see you out on the river soon. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Keep